I'd be content with showing friendship in words alone. Do not be content with showing friendship in words alone. Let your heart burn with loving kindness for all who may cross your path. Let your heart burn with loving kindness for all who may cross your path. We're here in Beethoven, in Norway, at the Norwegian Summer School 2014, learning about the 12 signs of love. The keynote speaker this year is Tom Price, who is the author of a book on the subject and is also a musician. There is a quotation in the Baha'i writings which expresses the theme of this summer school. They whose hearts are warmed by the energizing influence of God's creative love cherish his creatures for his sake and recognize in every human face a sign of his reflected glory. Tom, would you please tell us about your upcoming book and your sessions at the summer school? Yes, the, the title of the book and the summer school is called The Twelve Signs of Love. And really what I wanted to do was define what love actually is in terms of practice. We often talk about love, I love this or I love that, but we don't know what it means. And so I divided love into actions. What can you do to be a loving person? Because sometimes we don't know what love looks like, what it behaves like. And so I divided love into 12 things. And if you can do those things, then you will be a more loving person. So you learn to listen to people, you learn to praise people, you learn to look at the good qualities in people, you learn to try and make people happy, you learn to forgive people when they do things that are not so uh, good to you and so on. These are the manifestations of love. In other words, love has to have some way of showing itself. And these are the ways you can show love. And in this way we can gradually practice the little things that in total make love. So if you want to be a more loving person to your family, to your mother, your father, your husband, your wife, your workmates, these are things that you can do, because everyone in the world needs to learn how to love more and more, and this is what the world needs. This is the most important thing everybody needs to learn. So we try to break it down into little manageable actions that each of us can try and do every day. I selected 12, because I like the number 12, and there's 12 months of the year and 12 signs of the zodiac and all kinds of different things. I'm a musician, you know, we have 12 notes that we play. So I thought this was a beautiful way of breaking love down into its small components. Let your heart burn Let your heart burn With love and kindness for all who may cross your path Let your heart burn Let your heart burn With love and kindness For all who may cross your path Aloha, friends. I, I have no idea what he said, so I, I just heard my name, but I don't know what else he said. And I'm a little scared today because it's my first day in Norway. I've never been to Norway before. And they've put three different microphones on me. There's one here, one here, one here, and all of them are wireless. You know, so that means that wherever I go, you can hear what I say. So I have to be very careful when I go to the bathroom or, or, or do anything because wherever I go now you can hear what I'm saying and thinking and whatever sounds I'm making. But it's really a delight to be here and to be in such a beautiful location to have this, this view and to see all the friends. I am uh, attending seven summer schools uh, on this tour and this is my third. I've just been to Finland and then to Sweden and now to Norway, and from here I go to Holland, and then to Greece, 
then to Italy, and then to Portugal, and then to some uh, events in the United States. And the program that I'm speaking about this year is the subject of a book that I'm writing called The Twelve Signs of Love. Some of you may have heard a small talk for about one hour on the internet called The Twelve Signs of Love. Did you hear that? Okay. It's not very detailed because it, I only was speaking for one hour, but one day I was giving some talks in Florida and I decided to just uh, look at Adabaha's teachings on love and see what they were and I decided to make 12 just because I like the number 12. There's not actually 12 signs of love, there's many signs, but I picked 12 of them and I gave this talk and they put it on YouTube and thousands and thousands of people uh, started writing and they liked it and everything. And so um, a publisher that I'm working with in the United States named Rain Wilson, who has a company called Soul Pancake, called me a few days later and he said, I like that. Can you write a book and we will publish it? I said, okay, I'll do that. But first I want to speak about it uh, in uh, various conferences and summer schools for a little while. And then when I have enough good ideas, uh, then I'll write it in a book. So you're helping me to write this book. It should be published in the end of uh, this summer uh, after I've done these talks. And really all it is, is Abdul Baha's teachings on what love is. So your English is much easier. So anyway, so uh, they asked me to write this book on love because really this is what the world needs to know. We need to know how to love. And love has to have some, it has to look like something. You have to know what love is. You can't just say love, 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 and so on. And so uh, this is what uh, I started to do. Now, last night when I came into the uh, hotel, I saw that everybody was watching the World Cup. Uh, did, have any of you watched the World Cup? How many of you were watching? Oh, you do? So you like it in this country? Do you ever win or do you ever play? <laughs> no? Oh, you don't? But you like it, is that right? And uh, it made me think of the message which the Universal House of Justice wrote only one month ago on June 6th. They wrote a message to the president of Brazil. Did you read that message? I thought it was interesting that the head of a religion would be writing to a country on the opening of a sporting event. And I want to read to you what they said. They said, few occasions can claim to embrace so wide a cross-section of humanity comprising peoples of varied ethnic, religious, and cultural backgrounds. It is clear to every observer that the sport has brought together these nations. You see, so they're praising the event because they said few events can embrace so wide a cross-section of humanity. And I read uh, uh, in, in the news that some of these events have been the most unified watched events in the history of mankind. In other words, more human beings on the planet were doing exactly the same thing at the same time than has ever been before. They continued to say, to rejoice in this fact is to reject prejudice in all its forms. Truly nothing is more striking about this extraordinary spectacle than its capacity to reflect the global culture that has emerged in this age. And in summoning together the nations in friendship, it powerfully suggests that collaboration and common endeavor are possible in all things. So the Universe House of Justice is saying, if you can do the World Cup, you can do everything else. <laughs> That's really what they're saying, or it suggests that you can do that. Isn't that interesting? It's, it's, it's fascinating. And then they continue to say, humanity today is bound in a global civilization. As the world advances in its organic evolution, let it reflect on the many qualities of the Brazilian people. So then they, they talk about the Brazilian people. They finish by saying, we anticipate a time when competition among the nations may be a phenomenon chiefly witnessed in the sporting arena, whereas interactions on the global stage will be dominated by cooperation, reciprocity, and mutual support. So basically, the Universal House of Justice can see good in even the World Cup, even the World Cup. Now, I, unfortunately, I have to go after this school to Holland, and they lost. 
So I'm not going to mention this because <laughs> I understand that they take it very seriously there and so I don't think I can mention it. But for us, it's very interesting to reflect on this because as I think about the World Cup, I think about a concept which is very useful for us and that is a game, any kind of sporting a game, is very similar to life. It's very similar to life. If you think about life and you think about a sporting event, there's quite a lot of similarities. I would like to ask you, if you have to learn to play a game, there are four things you need to know. Four things you must know if you want to play the game. What is the first thing you want to know if you want to play a game? What are the rules? And even more important than that, of course the rules, more important than that, it is what is the aim of the game? What is the purpose of the game? How do you score? How do you get points or how do you do, isn't that right? What do you do to score? Because if you don't know what that is, what's the point? Sometimes people will play a game and they, they do lots of things, but those things aren't counted and so when the game is over, it doesn't really matter. Sometimes they even do the wrong thing. I one time read about someone who was playing soccer and they kicked the goal into the opponent's <laughs> goal. You know, they kicked it into the wrong goal and not only did they not get a point, the other team got a point and then he was murdered by his, his own country. Did you know that? <laughs> you know, I was reading about this and so on. So it's not good uh, to do the wrong thing. You need to know what is the right thing to do and how do you score. In soccer, the way in which you score is you kick the ball through the net of your opponent's goal. Isn't that right? What is the goal that gives you a point, a score in life? And I would like to propose to you in this course that it's any act of love. Any time you perform an act of kindness, of generosity, of friendship, of courtesy, any expression of love is like scoring a goal in life. That's really what I want to uh, propose to you. What is the second question you're probably going to ask if you have to play a, goal, uh, play a, play a game? You're probably going to ask, what do I have? What are the tools I have to help me to score? You know, what do I have? What tools do I play with? Is it my feet? Is it my hands? Is it a bat? Is it this? And who are my teammates? Who am I going to play with? I need to know this because I need to know what are the things that I need to have to enable me to score so I can win this game. And I would like to tell you that I'm going to give you 12 teammates during this course. 12 teammates, they are the 12 signs of love. They are the teammates that are going to enable you to score in this game of life. The third thing you're probably going to ask if you're going to play a game is who are my opponents? Who am I playing against? You know, you need to know that. You need to respect your opponents. You need to understand what they're going to do and what they're not going to do and play hard against them. And so I picked your opposing team for your game of life and you have to play against this team. The team, I picked 12 players, even though soccer is 11, they are envy and jealousy, selfishness, pride, ego, materialism, money, power, superstition, luxury, idle fancy, and vain imaginings. So is that a good team? Are you afraid of that team? Is that team like Germany or I, I shouldn't say that. It, I mean, is it a strong team? Yes, it is. And you have to understand the team and you have to know that this is what you're fighting against. But the fourth question that you'll ask whenever you play a game is the most important one of all. It's the most important one of all. What is that? What is the most important thing you need to know about a game? Anybody? Raise your hand. Come on. In football, cooperation. Yes, but there's something even more important than that. More fundamental, yes? Okay, it's very important, but that's one of the things how you are going to achieve your goals. No, the most important thing is when is the game going to end? <laughs> because all games end. There is a time in which it stops and you count up how many scores you've made. If a game doesn't end, it's not a game. There's no purpose to it. The whole point of a game is that it ends. And, and otherwise, you wouldn't play. If, how many of you have ever played tennis and you just hit the ball and you don't keep score? Do you play the same way as if you're scoring the game? No, it's a completely different thing. Or if you play golf and you don't count how many strokes, is it the same as when you count the strokes? 
No, of course you have to score and there has to be an end. Now most people, they don't like it when you tell them the end of a movie. If you're going to a movie and before you go someone tells you the end, do you like that? No, it spoils it. Or if you're reading a book and they tell you the end of the book, do you like that? Okay, I'm going to spoil the movie of your life <laughs> right now. I'm going to spoil the movie of your life right now. I'm sorry to do this, but you're going to die in the end. Okay? I just ruined it for you. I'm sorry you wanted to be surprised, but that's what's going to happen. But thinking about the fact that it's going to end enables you to play the game properly. If you're playing a game and, and you're, it's late in the game and you haven't scored, the announcer will say, oh, they missed so many opportunities. They missed so many opportunities because they didn't do it. And so in the same way, life is like that. Abdu'l-Baha actually said that the surest way to uh, become spiritual is to acquire a thirst for spirituality and you can do this best by meditating on the future life. If you meditate on the future life. Most of us, we don't think about death too much or we're afraid of it or we're scared of it. We don't talk about it to the children or something like this. But Abdu'l-Baha had a joyous attitude towards it. And Baha'u'llah said, death is a messenger of joy. But we have to think about it because we know that we're going to go there. And when we go there, they're going to count up how many goals we scored in life. How many did you kick through the net? And I believe that it's every time you are loving to someone, you kicked a goal. That's what I think. There's an old story come from Sufi mysticism about a man who was riding a camel through the desert, a long uh, trip through the desert. And uh, he rode for many, many days on his camel. And then he came up to a dried up riverbed. It was just a riverbed that was dried. And as he got there, a voice cried out and said, stop, get off your camel and pick up the stones in the dried up riverbed. So, he got off his camel, he picked up a big handful of stones, and he put them in the bag, saddlebag of his camel. And then he got on his camel, and the voice cried out, Good, because you have obeyed, tomorrow you will be both happy and sad. And he couldn't figure that out. He said, How can you be both happy and sad? So he didn't know. So he got, stayed on his camel, and he rode off into the sunset. That night he set up camp, and he went to sleep. He woke up the next morning and he remembered the strange events of the previous day and he went to his saddlebag and looked inside. And it turned out that every one of those stones had turned into precious gems. They were diamonds and rubies and emeralds. And as he looked at them in his hand, he was happy that he'd taken them. But he was sad that he hadn't taken more. <laughs> because the riverbed was full of stones and he realized only then how valuable it is. Perhaps that's how we'll feel in the next world. We'll realize that this life is full of opportunities, full of opportunities to score and to obtain something valuable that we may not realize how valuable they are until we make that journey into the next world. And I believe that we are being given the opportunity to score a goal every time God places a person in front of us. It's called, like a corner kick. You know in, in soccer, uh, you kick from the corner and it comes across and then someone receives it and then they can kick it into the goal. Is that right? Okay. And sometimes they get the nice corner kick and they don't do it and the announcer says, oh, he missed that opportunity. I think every time God puts a person in front of you, it's a corner kick <laughs> right to you and you have the choice to either show love to that person and score a goal or not. And maybe in the next world the announcers are looking down at you and saying, oh, he got a perfect corner kick and he didn't kick it through the goal. So we need to learn how to love. That is what I'm trying uh, to talk about. And I believe that in order to understand love, we need to look at it scientifically. You know, Shoghi Effendi described the Baha'i faith in a statement to the United Nations in which he, he said the Baha'i faith is, and then he described it in about five or six things. Have you ever seen that statement? If you go back and look at it, uh, you'll find it's this universal and so on. But one of the things he said the Baha'i faith is, is it's scientific in its methods. That was one of the five or six things Shoghi Effendi first listed as the Baha'i faith. It's scientific in its methods. And this is an interesting thing, because I don't know of any religion that has defined itself as being scientific. So the scientific method has a very particular attitude. And that means that we need to understand things more by what they do and how they behave than by just giving them names. 
So I want to describe to you the scientific method um, from uh, a book called The Making of a Scientist by Richard Feynman. Some of you probably know Richard Feynman is considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest, scientists of the 20th century, equal to Einstein. And he wrote this book to uh, describe what is the scientific method. And in the beginning, he writes this. He says, when he was a boy, he says, one kid came up and said to me, see that bird? What kind of bird is that? He said, I said, I haven't the slightest idea what kind of bird it is. And the little boy said, it's a brown-throated thrush. Your father doesn't teach you anything. And so he said, but it was exactly the opposite. He says, my father had already taught me. See that bird, he said, it's a Spencer's warbler. He says, you see, I really did know the name. Well, in Italian, it's a chuto lapita. In Chinese, it's a chung lung ta. In Japanese, it's a katano kateda. You can know the name of that bird in all the languages of the world, but when you're finished, you'll know absolutely nothing about the bird. You'll only know about humans in different places and what they call the bird. So let's look at the bird and see what it's doing. That's what counts. I learned very early the difference between knowing the name of something and knowing something. And this is what it is about love. It's easy to know the name of love, but to know what it does exactly what it does is quite different. And Abdu'l-Bahá said that love has to have some form of physical expression, some form of expression in the world. He says water has certain powers and abilities, it does things. The sun has certain powers, it does things. If it just existed and didn't do anything, what is the point? I read um, uh, a long time ago that they said that the Chinese have many words for rice. Did you know that? They have many words for rice. They don't just have one word for rice. So depending on what condition it's in, or cooked, or not cooked, or bought, or not bought, they, they have different words for rice. Because they deal with rice so much that they have many names for it. I also read that the Eskimos have many words for snow. But they just don't have one word for snow because they deal with snow so much that they have. And I, said, I mentioned this in Finland. They said, we have more words for snow than the Eskimos, they said. In this country, do you have lots of words for snow? OK. So when you deal with something a lot, you have many words for it. I read also that the Arabs have many words for sand, depending on you know, various conditions and so on. So it's quite clear that when you deal with something a lot, there are many facets to it, and so you have many words. Well, I think perhaps we need this with love. We use the word love, but it's such a broad thing. Maybe we need to understand it more. And maybe the more we deal with it, the more we'll have different facets with it. So I want to suggest to you that the 12 things I'm going to mention uh, during this week, these are the different facets of love. And if you do these 12 things, you will be loving. And if you think you love somebody, but you're not doing any of these things, you don't really love them. It's as simple as that. You don't really love them. So before I begin with the, with the first principle, I want to just mention a few concepts in the Baha'i writings about what love is. We're told by Adu'l-Baha that love is a power. It's a power. You know, it's like nuclear power or, or gravity or electromagnetism. In other words, there are physical powers. He says love is also a power. But love, he says, is the greatest power in the universe. And if you read how he describes this, he says that love is pretty much the same as attraction or unity or life. All of those things are one and the same. He says if you look in the universe, you'll find that things are bound together and they're held together. For some reason, atoms hold together with their subatomic particles and they, they hang together with some kind of power of attraction. And then atoms themselves hold together and form molecules. Nobody knows exactly why. There's a mysterious power. And these molecules then can form, um, by, you know, molecular biology can form living molecules and they have attraction. And it extends outward and outward right throughout all of the planets, he says, into the galaxies and into the nebula. There's nothing but attraction. He says, wherever you see attraction, there's life. And whenever you see death, there is disintegration and the loss of attraction. So he says that love is a power. Love is a power, unity is a power. A lot of us don't think of unity as a power, but Baha'u'llah said so powerful 
is the light of unity. So we don't realize that we hold within ourselves a power, and that's love. It's a power stronger than electricity, stronger than magnetism, stronger even than the nuclear forces. And in one remarkable tablet of Al-Dabaha, he says, know thou of a certainty that love is, and then he lists um, 18 things. He lists 18 things he says love is. All of them are related to a power. He says love is the secret of God's holy dispensation. Love is the manifestation of the all-merciful. I'm not going to read them all, but if anyone wants the, the reference, I can give it to you. And he says, he says that love is the most great law that ruleth this mighty and heavenly cycle. Love is the unique power that bindeth together the diverse elements of the material world. So if you look in the world here and you look at every single thing, how it's all being held together, the atoms are held together, Adabaha says that's the same power, that's love, that's holding it together. He says love is the supreme magnetic force that directeth the movements of the spheres in the celestial realms. So if you look at you know, the stars in the sky or the planets, if they say, what's holding it together? If you ask a scientist, ask you, you know, what's holding that? Somebody will say, oh, it's gravity or something like that. You say, no, it's love. It's love because there's only one principle that's manifested itself throughout all of creation. So love is a power. The next thing Adabaha said is that love is the message of all the messengers of God. All the manifestations of God brought the message of love. In one uh, statement that he gave in a talk, he said, all God's prophets have brought the message of love. And if you go and read the scriptures of Hinduism, of Judaism, of Islam, you'll find over and over again that love is the greatest commandment. In Christianity, love has been called the greatest commandment, and it's been called the new commandment. These are, this is what theologians will often refer to because of the wording of certain texts in the Gospels. I'll read you these and we'll, we'll see how it comes to this. In the book of Mark, chapter 12, Jesus was asked, which is the first commandment of all? It's the first commandment. And Jesus answered him, the first of all commandments is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength, this is the first commandment. And the second is this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. You see, that's why they call it the greatest commandment. The commandment is love God with all your heart and your mind and your soul and love your neighbor the same way you love yourself and there's no commandments greater than these. They're the greatest commandment. And of course, it's called the new commandment because after the Last Supper, the last time Jesus spoke to his disciples, um, uh, he spoke to them, and it's in John chapter 13. He says, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love, love for one another. And that was his commandment. Now, we're told in the Baha'i writings that love is the foundation of all our work. Love is the foundation of all our work. Everything that we do only works if we do it with love. And so Shoghi Effendi, for example, uh, he'd said that, he said that without real love for Baha'u'llah, for the faith and the believers for each other, the cause can never succeed. He says it could never really bring in large numbers, and over and over again it could never succeed. Some of us think that Baha'i work is to, for example, go to assembly meetings, or to go to core activity meetings, or to reflection gatherings, or to have children's uh, classes, or to be on committees. Is that Baha'i work? How many think that's Baha'i work? Okay. Yes, it's Baha'i work, isn't it? But we're told in every uh, instance that none of this will work without love. So it doesn't matter if, you, uh, if you're going to national assembly meetings, local assembly meetings, an auxiliary border carrying out their work, a reflection gathering, whatever. If it's not done with love, it's not going to work because love is the foundation. We're told by Abdu'l-Bahá that in consultation, love is the foundation. 
Love, he says, love, and we'll read that. I remember reading a passage of Abdu'l Baha in the United States where he was asked questions. And there was one question he was asked that I thought was a really stupid question. I thought, why did they ask that? You know, have you ever heard a question that you just think is stupid? And I thought, why did they ask Abdu'l Baha that? And I'll read it to you. It's in Promulgation of Universal Peace. Someone says to Abdu'l Baha, says, is peace a greater word than love? That's what they said. They said, is peace a greater word than love? And I thought, what a stupid question. Now, of course, Abdu'l Baha was talking mainly about peace. He was traveling around. He spoke at peace conferences. The book that was published about his talks is called Promulgation of Universal Peace. In other words, this was a message to a world that was heading towards war in, in 1912. And so maybe they were concerned about peace a lot, but they asked Adabaha this question I thought was really silly. Is peace a greater word than love? You know, who cares what word is better or not like that? And Adabaha answered this way. Here's what he said. He said, no. Love is greater than peace. So Adabaha didn't treat it as a silly question. He actually answered. He said, no, love is greater than peace. For peace is founded on love. Love is the objective point of peace, and peace is an outcome of love. Until love is attained, peace cannot be attained. But there is so-called peace without love. In another passage, he was talking about peace, and he said, peace must first be established among individuals until it leadeth in the end to peace among nations. So if you want to cause peace among nations, if you want to cause world peace, you can do it by showing love amongst individuals. It's, it, there's, there's a relationship. And in every other aspect, we are told over and over again in the Baha'i writings that without love, we cannot do anything. So this is the foundation. This is the foundation to what uh, we must do. Here's an example. Adabaha says, Tr consultation. True consultation is spiritual conference in the atmosphere of love. Members must love each other in the spirit of fellowship in order that good results may be forthcoming. Love and fellowship are the foundation. You know, if you ask me what would be the foundation of consultation, I would probably say, oh, I think it has to be wisdom and knowledge and having really good ideas or, you know, something along those lines. Adabaha says that's not the foundation of consultation. It's love and fellowship. There's another interesting um, um, uh, passage about love from the Universal House of Justice, and it has to do with children's classes. Throughout the Baha'i world now, Baha'is are educating children in a systematic way. Uh, how many people in this room have been involved in some way with the core activities to educate children? Okay, so about a third of you in the room. Some of you, how many of you are actually conducting children's classes? Okay, so just one or two. How many have been involved in the, in the books where they've studied or trained others to do so? Okay, and about a third. And so the rest of you are not involved in the education of children, is that correct? Okay, well, this is, this is, I, just, I just want to get this clear, just to, to see what, it, what it's like. So I want to read to you what the Universal House of Justice has said about what is necessary for the education of children. They say that institutes must be certain to include programs for children, it's part of the core activities. And they explain that this is a very important thing that we have to do, and of course this is a, a focus in the Baha'i world. And then they say this, they say, but although providing spiritual and academic education for children is essential, this represents only a part of what must go into developing their characters and shaping their personality. So all the stuff that we're doing with the, with the core activities and the children's classes and the books and so on, it's only a part. So what's the other part? What is the other part that the House of Justice is talking about? They say, the necessity exists, too, for individuals and the institutions at all levels, which is to say the community as a whole, to show a proper attitude towards children and take a general interest in their welfare. So now they're saying it's just as important that everybody else take a certain attitude of love towards children. They continue to say children are the most precious trust, sorry, children are the most precious treasure a community can possess. The most precious treasure. Precious. What do you do with precious things? 
What do you do with precious things? And don't tell me you lock them up in a safe, which they told me in Ireland when I asked that question. But you, you, you don't do that with your children. But what do you do with precious things? You guard them, you value them, isn't that right? You take care of them, you look after them. Children in the House of Justice are the most precious trust. The House says they bear the seeds of the character of future society, which is largely shaped by what adults constitute in the community do or fail to do with respect to children. They say, whatever you do or whatever you fail to do to children will shape the future of humanity in one way or the other. They are a trust no community can neglect with impunity. And all embracing love of children, the manner of treating them, the quality of the attention shown them, the spirit of adult behavior towards them, these are among the vital aspects of the requisite attitude. Okay, so now the House of Justice is saying that in order for this to work, every Baha'i has to have an all-embracing love of children. They have to have a particular manner of treating children. They have to have a certain quality of attention shown to them. <coughs> there must be a certain spirit of adult behavior towards them. I want to ask that question again. How many people in this room are involved in the spiritual education of children? Uh, come on, everybody put your hand up now. <laughs> everyone. Some of you are doing it through the classes, but everyone else must be doing it through an all-embracing love every time you see a little child. And every time I think about a little child, like a little baby, I see a little baby, I always like to think of Varga, the hand of the cross. I don't know if you know the history of Varga, but he was a very eminent hand of the cause. He came from an eminent family of martyrs. His uncles and, and ancestors uh, were, were great martyrs. And Shoghi Effendi had appointed him a hand of the cause of God. And in the presence of all the hands, he one time pointed to Varga and said, amongst all the hands, he's the most eminent. This is Mr. Varga. And it so happens that uh, Mr. Varga was asked by al Baha to travel with him to the West. So when he traveled to Europe and America, Varga was with him. And if you see the pictures of the four or five Persian men that are always standing behind al Baha, one of them is Mr. Varga. And while Mr. Varga was in the United States with al Baha in 1912, his wife had a baby. And he wasn't there for the birth of his, his son. But his brother took a photograph of the baby and mailed it to him in the United States. And al Baha, I guess he was a little nosy or something, I'm not quite sure how it happened, but one day he said, did anyone receive any correspondence, you know, back from Iran? And Mr. Varga said, yes, in fact I did. My, 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 uh, my wife had a baby and they sent me a little picture. And al Baha said, let me see that picture. So he handed the picture to al Baha, and al Baha looked at it. And he looked at it and he kissed it. And then he took out a pen. And on one of the hands of the baby, he wrote the word hand. And on the other, on the right hand, on the left hand, he wrote the word confirmed. Wrote the word confirmed. And then across the forehead, he wrote Ya Baha'u'llapa. He completely ruined the photograph. He just, you know, <laughs> wrote all over the, And he gave it back to Mr. Varga. And the family still have that photograph in their possession but they never knew the meaning of it until 44 years later when that little baby who grew up was appointed a hand by Shoghi Effendi at the age of 44. He was appointed just before the guardian passed away. He appointed them. And, and they asked the guardian, said, did you know that Adi Baha had written hand on him when he was just born? And Shoghi Effendi said, apparently I didn't know. But the point is, is that Abdu Baha had the spiritual vision to see even in a little infant his future. We may not have that power or capacity, so we have to look at every little child we see, every Baha'i child in our community the same way, that they could be future servants of the cause in very great ways, hands of the cause maybe, or maybe not, but, but some other thing equivalent to that. Every little child we have to see with those eyes. And it doesn't take a lot of time it's, it's the quality of attention. It doesn't take that much time to do it. I'll give you a good example of this. When I was a Baha'i youth, um, I became a Baha'i at the age of 15. And when I turned 18, I planned to go to my first international Baha'i youth conference. It was in 1974, and it was in Hawaii. 
And in those days, youth conferences were like Woodstock. They were big festivals, and the Baha'is got together, and they sang, and it was so exciting. And so I was really excited to go to this first international Baha'i youth conference, and we found that three hands of the cause were going to be there. They're Mr. Fazy and Mr. Uh, Bill Sears and Collis Featherstone. There were you know, three hands of the cause here, and this was even more exciting. And so we gathered up the money, and I think about 20 youth from Australia got together. And as I was leaving, I have a brother who's 10 years younger than me. He's 10 years, I was, I was 18, he was eight years old. And he comes up to me just as I was leaving, he says, when you see Bill Sears, tell him that I just read my very first Baha'i book, God Loves Laughter, and I really liked it. And he tells me to tell that to Bill Sears. And I didn't have the heart to tell this eight-year-old boy that I'm probably not going to see Bill Sears. You know, there's thousands of youth there and so on. So I said, okay, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll tell him. And so we go to the youth conference, and there's thousands of people there, and Seals and Crofts were singing, and, and Dan and England, Dan, they were have a big, big festival and party, and it was so much fun. And it was in this huge gymnasium at a university. And one afternoon, they cleared the gymnasium, and they put the three hands of the cause in the front, and you could get in line, to shake the hand of one of them. But, and the, and, but you could only get in one line. You could get in the Bill Sears line, or the Carlos Feliz line, or the Fazy line. And the lines went all the way out of the gymnasium and outside. And so I came and looked, and I said, no, I'm not getting in that. You know, it's going to take hours. So I just, I wasn't interested in that. And then I remembered that I'd said to my little brother that I would tell this to Bill Sears. So I got in the Bill Sears line. And I waited, and I waited for an hour or more, you know, slowly. Each, and they just shake the hand and go, shake the hand and go. Kind of like seeing the portrait of Baha'u'llah or something. You don't get much time. So finally I get up to Bill Sears, and I walk up to him, and I say, uh, my little eight-year-old brother wanted me to tell you that he read God Loves Laughter and his first book, and he really loved it. And his face lit up. He said, oh, did he? He says, go home and give him this hug for me. And he gives me this big <laughs> hug. And he hugs me really, really hard. And my head is over his shoulder, and I start crying uncontrollably, because it's like such a powerful hug. And he just he says, give this hug to him for me. And I'm crying, and then I go through. Now, the interesting thing is, this was 40 years ago. It was 40 years ago, and I still remember that Bill Sears hug. I never will forget it. And it was probably 15, 20 seconds of his life. That's all it was. But I will never forget it. And I often think, can I? in 15 or 20 seconds with a Baha'i youth or a child have the same effect that even 15 seconds that they in 40 years will still remember that love. You see, at that moment, Bill Sears kicked a goal. He kicked a goal and he scored. And I don't know how many goals he has kicked in his life, but it doesn't take time. It's what the House of Justice says. It's the manner of treating children. It's the love. You can do this at all times. You have an opportunity to kick a goal every time you see a little child. You see, this is the spirit that we're told in the Baha'i faith. So this is what we need to learn in life, is that we were called in this world to do something that is very great, and that is to become loving to one another, to become loving to one another. Now, Abdu'l Baha says that the more you become loving to somebody, the more you are close to God, the more you are near to God you are nearer to God. Now, a lot of people, we don't really know what God is. You mean, can you, how, how many of you can see God? You look around, where is God? Can you see God? Yeah, we, don't, we don't understand that. In fact, we don't even have a good concept that God is around. I remember when I was um, uh, in Los Angeles not too long ago at a Baha'i meeting, there were a lot of tables where they were eating, and you took your food and then sat at a table. So I took some food, and I went to a table, I saw an empty space, and I asked the lady next to me, I said, can I sit here, is it empty? And she was a Persian lady, and she said, ya khoda. She said to me, she said, ya khoda, like that. Is there any Persians here? Yes. She said, ya khoda. So I said, what does that mean, ya khoda? She said, I don't know. She said, we say it, if you want to sit there, you can sit there. I said, well, does the Hoda mean God? She said, does the Hoda mean God? Because I knew, it. she said, I think it does. And there was another Persian on the table. She said, no, it doesn't mean God. It means something else. And then the two Persians started a little bit of a discussion, you know, about this. I know it's surprising to you that any two Persians would ever argue. You know, it's never happened, but this is what happened. And so, so, I said, you know, that's interesting, because in English we have many words that have God in them, 
but we don't think of God when we say them. For example, if we say goodbye, that originally meant God be with you. But when we say goodbye to someone, we don't think of God. We just think, goodbye, get out of here, get out of my face, go away. <laughs> We're thinking about them going. There's no God in our consciousness, isn't that right? Or if we say the word enthusiasm or enthusiastic, any word that has thu in it means God, feel. So if you say enthusiasm, you think having God within. But when I say someone is enthusiastic, I don't think they have God inside them. You know, we're not, we don't think of it. There's a particular Persian phrase uh, that I always thought meant no, and that phrase is inshallah. And the reason I thought inshallah meant no is that whenever I asked a Persian if they would do something or be somewhere, if they said inshallah, they usually then weren't there and didn't do it. <laughs> so I just figured it meant no. Later on, I found out that it actually means by the will of God. And I realized that if a Persian is definitely going to do something or be somewhere, they'll tell you they're going to do it. But if they don't want to do it, they blame it on God. You see, that's how <laughs> they do it. So they, they, there's only a, a few times when we think of God. And Shoghi Effendi had an interesting word that you see sometimes in his writings, and the word is theophany. Theophany. Theophany, it means the actual concept and realization that God is present in the world, that you can feel God or see God. Anything that ends in phani, phani, like epiphany or euphony, it has to do with a consciousness, a consciousness uh, or awareness of the presence. And we're told that in the Old Testament, when we read it, there's a lot of theophanies where God actually comes and interacts in the world, that God, is, God comes down and he smites those people and he goes and does that and he raises up those people and God seems to be really putting his hand in the world. And so there's a lot of theophany in the old days. But we don't have a sense of theophany in these days. We don't have a real sense of feeling that God is interacting, that God is here in this room, that God is in the world. We don't have this sense. Shoghi Effendi used the word theophany and he had that same concept when he titled the first hundred year history of the Baha'i faith that he wrote. What is the title of that? God passes by. The hero of the book is not Baha'u'llah or Abdu'l-Baha or the Baha'is or the Bab. The hero of the book is God. It's God passes by and many people look at that title and they say that's so interesting. Shoghi Effendi had the concept of theophany. So Abdu'l-Baha says you need to have a sense that God is here. But what is God? And where is God? And Adabaha says, God is something that dwells with inside you. God dwells inside you. If you want to find God, God is inside you and God is inside other people. But he's inside you in the form of love and compassion. Anytime you show love towards God, sorry, love towards people, you are being like God because you'll find God with inside you. So Adabaha was asked, what does nearness mean? And he explained that nearness is based on the hidden word where Baha'u'llah says, sanctify, thy heart is my home, sanctify it for my descent. Thy spirit is my place of revelation. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, how many of you are like me, that you never really clean your house until someone's going to come and visit? Uh, how are you like that? You don't clean your house as well, but if someone's going to come and visit, then you really clean your house. Is that right? And sometimes, you know, you've got someone visiting, so you clean your house really well. Isn't that right? And then they come and visit for half an hour and they go away. And then for a week, you're so happy that your house is clean. And you're so grateful that they came because it forced you to clean your house. Is that right? Anyone, anyone like that? I know some people, their house is always clean. But for me, I only clean my house if someone's going to come and visit. And that's what the hidden word says. God says to man, your heart is my home. Clean it, sanctify it for my descent. I'm not coming until you clean your house, okay? And then you clean your house for God to come and visit. And Adabaha said that this is what life is all about. It's that God dwells within us. And Adabaha said that nearness to God is when you become more like God. You behave like him. You are loving to other people. Then God is inside you. He said nearness is likeness. It's like if two things are close to each other, that's physical nearness. But there's another kind of nearness where two things are like each other. And he says nearness to God is being like God. And so that when we become loving, we become closer to God. And suddenly we realize that God is in us, here and now, 
and in other people wherever there are beautiful, loving qualities. Wherever you see kindness, you're seeing God. Wherever you see generosity, you're seeing God. Wherever you're seeing uh, any loving quality, you're actually seeing God. And that's why Adabaha says in the Bible, it says God is love. So I want to change. If you don't believe in God or you find it hard to believe in God, believe in good qualities. Believe in generosity. Believe in courtesy. Believe in kindness. Believe in friendship. Those are God. And the more you behave like that, the more God is in you and you'll find God inside you. And so this is the essential teaching of love. Furthermore, Adabaha says that love must be unlimited. It must be completely unlimited, not bound by any limitations. He says, for example, if you love your family. How many of you love your family? You do? You love your family? Because I remember I was, I was mentioning a quotation of the writings that said, we should love everybody like our brother. And somebody raised his hand, he says, yes, but I hate my brother. So <laughs> I said, well, you, you should love. But you love your family. Nadabaha says, love of family is good, but it's a semi-selfish love, because it means that if you only love them because they are of your family, that means that if they're not your family, you won't love them. He says the same way if you love your nation or your race or your religion or your culture or your background. If you love them for only that reason, then you won't love someone else. Where he says Baha'i love is the love that you love everyone exactly the same way, unlimited love. Secondly, he says that love must be to all people whether they are good to you or not. He says you must love your enemies. How many of you love enemies? Come on, tell the truth. Anybody? It's not that easy, isn't it? You do? You really love your enemies? Yes. You have to love your enemies. Now, the point is, is that if we think that love is something we feel, it's very hard to love them, because I don't really feel very loving towards them. But if we think that love is a set of discrete actions, there's things that you do, then you can do those to your enemies. Do you understand? Love is not merely something you feel, love is something you do. The 12 signs of love are things that you can do. So even if you don't feel any great like, liking of, of your enemy, you could still do these things and then you are loving your enemies. That's why it's so important to break love down into these uh, situations. Adabaha says, um, everyone you love, you must love them with infinite love. And he says, whatever someone does to you, do not do back to them what they did to you, if it's a bad thing, okay? So if someone poisons you, he says, give them honey in return. He says, if they hurt you, you know, uh, be, be healing to them. If they yell and scream at you, be kind back to them. Never respond to them in the, in the same way they give you. There's an old saying in English which is not true. I don't even know why we have it. It says, you have to fight fire with fire. Have you ever heard that? You have to fight fire with fire? Makes no sense, because for an analogy to work, it has to actually make sense in the real world, okay? Everyone knows you can't fight fire with fire. You, you put fire on fire, it doesn't put out the fire, does it? It increases the fire. So why do we have that saying? It's not, it doesn't make any sense. And yet, so often, when somebody yells at us, we yell back at them. Isn't that right? If I want to make somebody yell, I yell at them, then they will yell back. If I do something to them, they do it back to us. And we're told we must not do that, whatever they do. In the Akdas, it's prohibited. It's anger. Do you know anger is prohibited in the Akdas? It says anger is in the synopsis and codification of Anger is prohibited. And I read this many times because when I was reading Adi Baha's Things on Love, in, the, in Chicago, he said to the Baha'is, he said, never be angry with anybody. Never be angry with anybody, he said that. And in the Akdas, Baha'u'llah says, uh, anger is prohibited. He says, if someone uh, sc speaks at you in anger, do not speak back in anger. And I thought, this is not the same way modern world looks at anger. Because there are some things that are prohibited outright, like, say, murder. <laughs> murder is prohibited outright, right? And there's other things that you just try to control. You try to manage, but they're not totally prohibited. So in anger, in English, we talk about anger management. You know, anger management, isn't that right? Try to manage your anger. 
We never talk about murder management, you know, like, oh, I'm trying to manage my murder. I'm trying to cut down, you know, reduce my murder to an acceptable level. Is that right? We don't talk about this. And it seems like Abdu'l Baha took anger over from the here and put it here. He made it totally prohibited. And I thought, well, but some people cannot do this. So I consulted um, uh, uh, some uh, psychiatrists in the United States, some Baha'i psychiatrists that work in this field. And one of them told me, this is interesting, because studies have shown that everybody, no matter how much difficulty they have in anger, are able to control their anger. To everybody. Because she said, you didn't, don't realize this, but anger is one of the primary uh, causes of marital breakdown. It's one of the main things that causes marriages to break apart because people, you know, the husband has anger towards the wife and yells or the wife has anger towards the husband or towards the children and so on. It's a, a big issue. And she said they have studied people that say they cannot control their anger. They say, I'm sorry, I, I know it's not good, but I can't help myself. I, I just can't control it. They study these people and they find that in other situations where anger is inappropriate, they're perfectly able to control their anger. For example, the same man that might yell and scream at his children or his wife and says he can't control it will work in a job for 30 years and never yell at his boss. Never once yell in anger at his boss, even when his boss is an absolute idiot. You know, even, he just won't do it. Why doesn't he do it? Because it's inappropriate. It's wrong. It's prohibited like murder. So when it's just totally wrong and prohibited, he can do it. He has the power. The only thing was is that he has to know that it's totally inappropriate. So this is the same in our relationships. Once we realize that anger is like murdering someone, it's like taking a gun and shooting them in the same way. We won't express anger to our wives, or our husbands, or our children, or our workmates, because we realize that it's totally prohibited. This is why Abdu'l Baha and Baha'u'llah said, just make it prohibited. In many cases, we don't give ourselves credit for what we are able to do. All we need to do is understand how important they are. So, I want to move on to the 12 signs of love. And what, how much time do I have today? What, what is the time now? You have 50 more minutes. How many? 15 more minutes until the break. Oh, 15 minutes. And then we'll go on to it. So, would you like me to tell you all 12 signs of love? Or would you like me to describe them all? In Sweden, I didn't tell them. I just, as we came to them, I did them, but in Finland I told them all in the beginning. What do you want? All in the beginning now and then discuss them? Or would you like me just to reveal them one by one as they come? How many want to hear them all right now? How many want them slowly revealed? Okay, so the, the Norwegians, they like to hear everything up front. Okay, so I'll tell you what are the 12 signs and over the next, you know, four or five days we will discuss in detail every one of these. The first sign of love is that you value love and unity over everything else. That you consider this the most important thing. It so happens that in the world today, we think certain things are more important than unity. For example, we think being right is more important than unity. Or we may think that getting our own way is more important than unity. And so this is an essential principle. It's an attitude that maintaining unity is the same as maintaining life. If you want to maintain life, you consider that more important than anything else. If you have, say you have a, a child, there are many things that you're concerned with about your child. You might be concerned about the clothes they wear, or the shoes they put on, or the homework they did, or the school they go to, or, or certain characteristics or behavior they have. There's many things you're concerned that are important for that son, and they're all good things. But let's imagine now that your son has an accident and he's nearly dead and he's on the operating table. And as he's on the operating table, are you concerned about what shoes he's wearing or not wearing? Are you concerned about what clothes? Are you concerned whether or not he did his homework? Uh, you see? Are you? No. Because life is the highest. And everything else is important, but they're not as important as that. And so, therefore, you would never place anything over that. For example, you wouldn't make your child do homework until he died. <laughs> you wouldn't put anything over life. So you could say that we actually have a life doctrine. A life doctrine is that life is the most important thing. Doctors have a life doctrine. We have some doctors here in the room. And keeping the patient alive is the most important thing. Isn't that right? 
There's a, an old joke about doctors. They say the operation was successful, but unfortunately the patient died. <laughs> and that's the joke that doctors like to use because you know, they did everything right, but the patient died, which really means it, it's not very true. So we have a life doctrine, but we don't have a unity doctrine. We don't have a love doctrine, that that's more important and that nothing that we can imagine, whether it's being right or getting our own way or anything, nothing should ever stop that. If anything is causing disunity, that means we're putting something else over the value of unity. That's number one. Number two is acceptance and tolerance. Acceptance and tolerance of other people to accept them for who they are to love them for who they are, to tolerate whatever they do, no matter how good or bad they are, is an essential quality of love. And until we can do that, we can't love people. There's an easy way to learn acceptance and tolerance, which we'll talk about when we come to that. The third sign of love is praise and gratitude. Praise and gratitude. If you cannot praise somebody, you can't love them. If you can't say it, you can't love them. God. How many of you love God? Anybody love God here? One, two, three. Good. So you love God, right? Now, you have to say to God that you love him every single day. You have to speak it out loud. Isn't that right? We're told we have prayers, obligatory prayers, and so on. You have to tell God you love him every single day. This is the essential nature of the man-God relationship. Now, don't you think God knows whether or not you love him? Doesn't God know? Does God really need you to tell him that you love him? Does you think he needs it? So why do you have to say it every single day? Why is it necessary? Well, it's just the way it is. There, there's a story of a lazy man that he printed a prayer and put it on the wall, and every time he went to bed, he pointed to it and said, those are my thoughts, God, you read them. You know, <laughs> it's not that way. You have to say it yourself to God. Now, here's the thing. If you do not praise and say you love your wife, every single day, or you do not praise and say you love your husband every day, or you do not praise your children and say you love them every day, you don't really love them. You can't say, well, you know, they know anyway. If God wants to be told it every day, if God needs it, how much more does your wife and your husband and your children? And so I told this story in Finland, and they said, well, in Finland, we never say we love you to our husbands and wives. And so one of the Finns told me uh, a joke that's apparently funny in Finland. It wasn't funny to me, but it's apparently <laughs> funny in Finland. And the story was, is that this man was married to his wife for 20 years, and the wife said, you've never said you love me. How come you don't say you love me? And the Finnish man said, said I did when we got married. He said, we got married 20 years ago, and I said, I love you. And she says, but you never said it since. He says, well, just consider that right until I tell you otherwise. <laughs> Apparently it's funnier in Finnish, I guess. But anyway, um, so I was, you know, I, I made good progress in Finland trying to explain this one, that we need to express it. And you need to learn to praise people. The easiest way to to correct any loving relationship or, or any bad relationship with anybody. You have, it's just to start praising the other people. And then gratitude as well. So that's the third sign of love. The fourth sign of love is to only see good in other people and never see the bad in them. And we'll talk about that. The fifth sign of love is a really important one, and that is listening. Learning to listen to other people and understand them. First trying to understand them before you try to make yourself be understood. The sixth sign of love, which is the hardest one, there's 12 signs of love, some are easy, the sixth one is hard, it's forgiveness. Learning to forgive people, and by the way, not forgiving people that are easy to forgive, forgiving the hard ones. You know, what is the point if someone's really lovable and you forgive a little tiny thing? No, you've got to forgive the really hard ones, and forgiveness is the easiest way to free your soul and to become a truly spiritual being and become more like God. In fact, God is forgiving. We expect God to be forgiving, isn't that right? So if we want to become like God, we have to forgive. The seventh sign of love is a kindly tongue, speaking in a kind, gentle manner to people. Speech is a very powerful uh, uh, thing, both positive and negative. Power Says, speech can be either like a sword thrust or like milk. 
He says it can either be like honey or like poison. He can either be like fire or it can be like the water of life. Baha'u'llah says speech has both powers. It's a very, very powerful force. And we need to learn to speak only in kind words if we want to be loving. Eighth, he says selfless and unconditional love, love that is completely free of self. Adabaha refers to a certain kind of love that he says it's the love of the butcher for the lamb. He says the butcher loves the lamb. Does the butcher love the lamb? Yes. If you ask the lamb, does that butcher love me? The lamb says yes. The butcher feeds me. He cares for me. He looks after me. Surely the butcher loves me. Does the butcher love the lamb? Yes, he does. But why? Why does the butcher love them? Because he wants to eat him or kill him or, or something like that. That's selfish love. That's love that's based on a certain condition. We have to be completely selfless. The ninth sign of love, if you want to love somebody and you want to show love to people, whether it be your friends or your neighbors or your husband, your wife, your children, is service. Learning to be of help to people in whatever they need. To serve people is a sign of love to be able to serve. The tenth sign of love is to always make people happy and to always cause happiness in other people, to always be the source of happiness. This is actually going to be my first sign of love, I think, when I, when I reorganize them. Because I found that this was the most important thing Adabaha wanted. Whenever he greeted someone, the first thing he wanted to know was, are they happy? And Adabaha said that whenever uh, you go to a feast, your main consideration should be, how can I make the other people happy? Trying to make people happy will lead you to all the other signs of love. Because if you think very carefully about, how can I make you happy? How can I make you happy? I will arrive at the principle that I need to listen to you. I will arrive at the principle I need to praise you. I will arrive at the principle that I shouldn't look at your bad qualities. In other words, trying to make people happy will ultimately lead uh, to all the other signs of love. The eleventh sign of love is the opposite. It's never make people unhappy, never cause grief. And a lot of us cause grief and unhappiness in people a lot. Have you ever made somebody unhappy? Yes? You have? Has anybody ever made you unhappy? Yes, so we go around making people unhappy, and there's many ways to make people unhappy. I think in, in Finland, I think we counted 20 or 30 or 40 ways. Isn't that right? Remember we counted all the ways, and the Finnish know every way to make people unhappy. You know, they, <laughs> they, they told us every single one. They also know some good ways to make you happy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, when we get to the happiness, all the ways you can make people happy. But this is a, a goal in life, to never even for one minute make anybody unhappy. And so there are many things that you may be doing in your life that are making people unhappy that you have to stop doing. And <coughs> the twelfth sign of love is what we call the golden rule. The golden rule says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's the most ancient teaching in all of humanity. It's contained in every religious scripture of every religion and even in every cultural background uh, that you can see from ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, India, China, all over the world, this particular rule is made. It's such a fascinating uh, rule. And um, uh, we're going to look at it again because Baha'u'llah has taken a new look at it. Now, you may wonder, how am I going to acquire these 12 signs of love? How many of you, when you just heard that list, said, I can't do all those 12? It's hard, isn't that right? Well, I want to read to you a statement from Shoghi Effendi where he says there's something that can help you to acquire love. He says, one can hardly imagine what a great influence genuine love, truthfulness and purity of motives exerts on the souls of men. But these traits cannot be acquired by any believer unless, and then he said something. He says, you can't imagine what a great influence genuine love is, but it cannot be acquired by any believer unless blank. Okay, I want you to tell me what you think that blank is. Okay, I'll read it again. These traits cannot be acquired by any believer unless he blank, unless blank. Who wants to make a guess? What do you think? Just, just have a guess. Raise your hand, somebody. 
Okay, so you're saying you cannot acquire love unless you have a, a relationship with God. How many think that's the right answer? One, two, three, that's good. I would say that, that's really good, because Adha Baha actually said that without love for God, you cannot love mankind. So I would have thought that's a good answer, but it's not the one that Yogi Fendi said. Okay, so let's try again. Somebody make a guess again. One can hardly imagine what a great influence genuine love can have, but these traits cannot be acquired by any believer unless what? Who has another guess? Over here. I'm sorry? Unless he has a pure heart, a clean heart? How many think that's what it is? You, they cannot be acquired unless you have a pure heart. Nobody thinks that's it? So what do you think it is? Then? Okay, what do you think it is? I'm sorry? What did you say? Did someone say? Okay, go ahead, tell me what you think it is. Unless which? Happy? Is that what you said? Okay, one cannot acquire love unless you're happy. How many think it's happiness? No? Well, what do you think it is then? It's got to be something. What do you think it is? He loves his own soul. So one cannot acquire love unless they love their own soul. How many think it's that? A few? Okay. Who's got another guess? Yes. Unless, unless you give love. Yeah, that's pretty good. You can't have love unless you give love. But that's kind of like saying you can't love unless you love. But what else do you think it is? Forget yourself. Unless you forget yourself. How many think that's what it is? Oh, good. A lot of people like that. Okay, what do you think it is? Understand unity. Unless you understand unity. Yes, what do you think it is? Unless you? Yes, unless you can receive love. Do you know that originally when I had my 12 signs of love, I had receiving love as one of them. I may try to squeeze it back in there. Yes, these are all good things. Would you agree? Every one of them is good. But Shogi Fendi says, you can't acquire all of these things unless you do something else. Who's got another statement? Unless you put it into action. How many think that's what it is? Unless you put it into action. Oh, a lot of people think that's what it is. And of course, Baha'u'llah himself said that religion without putting it into practice is nothing. He says it is incumbent upon every man uh, to translate that which has been written and put it into action, to translate it into action. So that is surely the most important thing, but no, it's not what Yogi Fendi said here. Who's got another guess? Yes, which he said one thing and only one thing can, can uh, 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 cause the faith to succeed, and that was how our inner life. So yes, we want our inner life to reflect uh, the character you know, the spirit and teachings of the faith. But how, does it, how do you do that? You cannot do it unless you do something. Yes? Service. Service. How many think it's service? Do you want me to tell you what it is? Yes. Okay. Yes. This is interesting. This is interesting because uh, all of these things are important and you must do every one. Nobody said a bad thing. I didn't hear anybody say anything bad. You know, they were all good. So you have to do all of them. But Shoki Fendi said, one can hardly imagine what a great influence genuine love truthfulness and purity of motives exert on the souls of men, but these traits cannot be acquired by any believer unless he makes a daily effort to gain them. <laughs> unless he makes a daily effort to gain them. So you see, this is the important principle, is that one has to make a daily effort to do something. If you don't make a daily effort, you will not gain them at all. You will not gain the role. Adha Baha used the phrase, kam, kam, ruse be ruse. Kam means little, little by little. Ruse means day, day by day. And he said, this is the way of the Lord, that you have to gradually uh, uh, learn to do something. If you do not break it down into daily practice, if you try, Baha'u'llah said, bring thyself to account each day. Ere thou art someone, did you, have you read that? Did he say, bring thyself to account each week? or bring thyself to account each month, or bring thyself to account each year or whatever. No, you have to do it each day. And only in this way can you move at all. I, I, I can prove it to you because recently there was a study on how they train birds to sing, or rather how birds learn to sing. Do you know birds have a very precise melody that they sing? It's very complicated in rhythm and notes. 
and scientists have been interested in how they learn that because you know birds have a very small brain you know and, and so on so how do they learn to sing so there was recently research it's on the internet you could see photographs of it in which they took and manufactured tiny headphones for birds they're little tiny headphones and they put them on the birds and strap them on and they stick them in the and you can see a picture of it on the internet and then they take the signal of the headphone and it comes out of there into a little microphone and the bird has a little microphone and then they interrupt that signal and they change the melody of the signal they change the melody of the signal so what the bird sings it changes in their ears and they did this and they tried to see if the bird could change its melody and here's what they found if they changed the melody quite a bit the bird didn't change one bit at all but if they changed it a little bit the bird would move it and then if they then changed it a little bit more the bird would move it and then a little more the bird would move it but if they did it too much too big the bird never changed one bit and this is what we are like if we try to change big we stay exactly the same for our whole life but if we do it in daily increments, uh, then we will change. And this is why the guardian said, you cannot acquire these virtues. So we're going to start, but we're going to take a break now because our chairman is getting very upset. <laughs> and we're going to continue and we'll begin now with all 12 signs of love. And I really look forward to seeing and talking with all of you for the next week. Thank you very much. Friendship and words alone Do not be content With showing friendship and words alone Let your heart burn with loving kindness For all who may cross your path Let your heart burn with loving kindness For all who may cross your path Let your heart burn, let your heart burn with loving kindness for all who may cross your path. Do not be content with showing friendship in words alone. Do not be content with showing friendship in words alone. Let your heart burn with loving kindness for all who may cross your path. 
Let your heart burn with loving kindness for all who may cross your path. Let your heart burn. Let your heart burn with loving kindness for all who may cross your path. Let. Let your heart burn. Let your heart burn with loving kindness for all who may cross your path.